Hello again, Gary Stearman with another edition of Prophecy in the News. With us again today, author, speaker, lecturer, Fred DeRuvo. You are not going to want to miss this one. Well, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. It's a pleasure to have Fred DeRuvo with us once again. And Thank Fred, you. Uh, always fun talking to you. Thank you. You too, Gary. And we're going to get serious today uh -oh. because we're going to deal with a serious question. Okay. What is an authentic Christian? Now, when we ask that question, it raises a lot of specters because, you know, the uh, Orthodox Christianity, right. authentic Christianity. Uh, there has been an ages long discussion, and, and Fred has written a book called Finishing the Race, uh, which talks really about the difference between salvation and rewards. If you've mm. ever thought about this question, you want to stay with us today. Fred? Yeah. Authentic Christianity. Yeah. Um, I started using that phrase because I wrote another book a while ago called The Anti-Supernatural Bias of Ex-Christians. And while I was researching the material for that book, what I found was that there was this growing group of people who called themselves ex-Christians. And I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, how can you be an ex-Christian? You were either a Christian and still are, or you never were. So my question to these people is, okay, what, what makes you think you were a Christian. Tell me, what convinced you you were a Christian? Mm. And invariably, they start listing off all the things they did. Oh, I prayed. I was a preacher. I did Bible study. Uh, some say I spoke in tongues. Some say I did this, did this, did this. And I stop them and I say, okay, you're telling me what you've done, but one thing you have not told me, which is found in John chapter 3, where Jesus talks about the spiritual transaction that must take place when he's explaining this to Nicodemus. And he, and he refers to it as you know, being born again or born from above. And the reality in my mind is that's what separates authentic Christianity, authentic Christians from those who simply profess to be Christians. So for a person who has professed to be a Christian, yes, they can walk away because they've never fully embraced Christianity. They saw the truth, but they never fully embraced it. A person who is an authentic Christian has had that, that transaction take place within them. And my question to them is, so you're telling me you're unborn again. So you broke the seal. You were able to break the seal of the Holy Spirit. Very interesting. How'd you do that? Wow. And of course, they would have no answer. But you're really talking about someone who has sort of dressed up in the clothing of Christianity. Yeah. And you, you had a, a, a very uh, uh, sort of dramatic analogy, you know, that you talked about a, a police officer's uniform. <laughs> and I think it, it really makes sense to go, go through that. Well, yeah, if, if I were to, and I've used this example for them, if, if I were to go out and get a, an authentic police officer's uniform and wear it, go buy a car and have it dressed up and painted to look like a police officer's car, and I drive down the street I can even start arresting people for infractions, although I could get in a lot of trouble, so I, I wouldn't do that, and I wouldn't recommend anyone else doing that. But the reality is, the person I'm arresting would think, until further investigation, that I'm an actual police officer, but I'm not. I'm just playing the part. I'm dressed up like one, I drive a car like one, but I haven't gone through the training, I haven't taken the oath, and I haven't been hired by a, a city that says, okay, you're a police officer now. So salvation is something more than behavior. Amen. It, it, infinitely more. Infinitely more. Let's talk about that. What yeah. is salvation? And by the way, if you're watching today and you're wondering about salvation, maybe in your own life, uh, Fred and I would, would love to see you come to Christ. Uh, if, if you're sitting there right now and you're saying, you know, I'm not sure. I'd like to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether I am one or not. Uh, Fred, what does that involve? What questions do you have to answer? Well, I always look at it as three, three separate and distinct steps, although they can happen just like that at the same time. Um, for instance, for a person to become a Christian, they first have to hear the truth. Someone has to preach it. Someone has to explain it to them. Then they have to see that truth. They have to realize the validity of that truth. Then they have to make 
a decision to fully embrace the truth. And you know, one of, the, one of my favorite examples is the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross is one minute, I believe it's in Luke 23, he's one minute reviling Jesus. He's hurling abuse at him. And then all of a sudden, he's asking him, Lord, just remember me when you come into your kingdom. What was he saying to him? He says, I recognize you as a king. Right. Now the reality is, what happened? Jesus was, we have no record that Jesus was preaching to the man. There was something that changed his mind. He somehow saw the truth. And when he saw the truth, he chose to embrace the truth. And we have another example in Luke, what is it here? The rich young ruler in Luke 18, starting in verses uh, 18. The certain guy comes up to him and he goes, good master, what shall I, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And I love, of course, Jesus' <laughs> response. Why are you calling me good? There is no one good except God. Mm. What do you really have to say about that? And so the reality was he explained salvation to this man as the man needed to hear it. He saw and heard the truth. And what did he do? Did he embrace it? No, he rejected it. He rejected it. And so I, I like to use those two examples because they're examples of people not just saying this quick little prayer and thinking, oh, it's all over and done. I can continue to live the way I've been living. But it's more or less a decision that stems from hearing the truth, understanding the truth, and making an actual decision to fully embrace the truth. And you know, it, it, as you were reading that, it strikes me, uh, he did reject the truth. But if you'd been standing there watching that, if you were a third party and you watched this transaction take place, you could probably say, well, you know, the rich young ruler makes a good case. He's got a lot to do. He has things planned. Yes. He's got a life that he needs to, to look after. And so he has made what for him is a perfectly logical decision to go on with life. Right. And doesn't he say at one point, oh, I've kept all those commandments since my youth. Yeah. And then Jesus says, oh, well, since you're being perfect, there's one thing you lack. And he was tied to his fortune. That was one thing. That was his God. So the reality was he could not let go of that to embrace the truth that Jesus was teaching him. Which, by the way, brings me exactly to where I wanted to be because the friend has, uh, has written this book, Finishing the Race, in which he discusses the difference between salvation and rewards. And the rich young ruler had his eyes set on earthly rewards. Exactly. There's a big difference between earthly and heavenly rewards. In fact, yes. let's go over to uh, the first Corinthians <clears throat> and uh, uh, chapter uh, three, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, at where uh, Paul is talking about being a co-laborer with God. Mm -hmm. And he says in verse 12, now if any man build upon this foundation, that is the foundation of Christ, mm -hmm. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it yep. because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Mm -hmm. And I've got to read the next couple of verses. Oh, you have to, absolutely. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet uh, so is by fire. So now we have something to talk about. Right. Rewards. What are rewards exactly, and how can we think about them in a way that, that glorifies God? Good question. And the way I understand this is, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Gary, but the way I understand this is this. And this, I'm glad you read those two additional verses because it discounts that Paul's talking, it negates the idea that he's talking about salvation. Right. Absolutely. So yes, he must be talking about something more than salvation. So what's he talking about? He's talking about rewards. Well, how can we think? Isn't it prideful or arrogant of ourselves to think, wow, not only do I have eternal salvation, but I can get rewards too? It's me, me, me. But that's not the way it is. Any rewards I might earn, and I hate to even use the word earn, any rewards that the Lord may give me, I'm going to toss right back at him mm. gently. I mean, with the utmost respect, it's like whatever rewards beyond salvation the Lord sees fit to give me, I'm going to take them off and gently toss them at his feet. Why? Because those rewards came because I did one thing by his grace. I submitted my life to him and allowed him to work in and through me for his glory. And I recognize that's how those rewards came to me. So in essence, they're his rewards. 
Mm-hmm. They're his rewards. I'm, I'll be grateful to throw them back at his feet. But I love this part too, though, in verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. What that tells me definitively is not that I have a license to sin, but for those people who do not fully grasp and understand the true meaning of salvation and how to live our life, there's still salvation. They might, they might be thinking, oh, I'm doing all this for the grace of God and the glory of God, and then come to find out, no, you weren't. You were doing it for you. And so those things are going to be burned up, but their salvation mm-hmm. will remain intact. You know, this idea of suffering loss, do you mean to tell me that the Bible is saying that, that uh, we can live what we consider to be a pretty good life here, but then upon examination on the other side, we might turn out to have lived in a not quite so perfect way. Yeah, yeah I think so. A- a- and isn't that contradicting salvation by grace to say that, well, you can lose things. That's not salvation by grace, is it? Well, actually, if you look at this carefully, it's not saying that we lose anything, really. It's saying that we just don't gain. So we have salvation. We don't lose that, right? We've never earned or gained rewards to lose them because we were probably too focused, unfortunately, on our own life, our own welfare, our own what we consider to be wants and needs in this life. The reality is this. I think that this is why Paul especially pushes his congregants so hard to finish the race, to push on for that prize. He's telling them, look, you're saved in Christ. Keep going. This is the beginning. It's not the end. You don't stop. You keep going so that God is greatly glorified. May I read some scripture? Absolutely, please. You know, this reminds me of Philippians uh, chapter 3 verse uh, 13 where Paul, the great apostle Paul says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Yeah. In other words, if anybody would count himself to have apprehended, it would be the apostle Paul. But he says, no, I don't. He says, but this one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark. Mm. For the prize, that's a reward. That is. For the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. So here's the great apostle Paul. So I'm just, uh, I'm going to keep pushing. away, yeah. Uh, Because, you know, when you run a race, it's it's effort. It it, it is commitment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, And we both agree that he's not talking about salvation, that he hasn't, he's not saying, I haven't apprehended salvation yet. Oh, that's he's true. talking mm-hmm. beyond that. He's talking about the prize. He wants to gain as many rewards as possible. And he even talks about this in another book when he says, you know what? I've done it. I've lived the life. Henceforth, there is a crown set up for me. Well, what is he going to do with that crown? Toss it at the feet of Jesus in worship. And that's what those rewards are for. So it's not that we lose salvation. It's not that we have to earn salvation, but it's way beyond salvation. And and the reality of people who sit there and say that, you know, you've got to be struggling and miserable and and you've got to be constantly beating yourself up in order to maintain salvation, I believe is completely in error. Now let's get serious, Fred. We're talking about rewards. Yeah. I've heard people say, that's not fair. Mm. It's not fair that, that some Christians should get up more rewards than others in heaven. Everybody gets the same thing because it's salvation by grace and not by works. Right, right. And they think of rewards as kind of <clears throat> putting someone down. Mm. They didn't know any better. Uh, mm. They didn't know as much as you. Why should they be punished in heaven? Or the other question is, <clears throat> how do you get paid in heaven? Big boxes of jewels, a giant house. Chocolate's fine for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chocolate on tap. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Right, go. Uh, how do you get paid in heaven? What would these rewards be? And, and, and you know, my answer yeah. is always, re- and by the way, you agree with me in your book, is this. Wouldn't you like to be close to the Lord? throughout eternity. That is, wouldn't you like to be sort of in his inner circle? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, wouldn't you like to have a really close relationship with him as opposed to being distant from him because you kind of pushed him away in this life? That's what I think rewards are. Uh, the yeah. proximity to the Lord throughout eternity yeah. would be the greatest reward I can think of. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and you know, we don't want to diminish. When I talk about rewards versus salvation kind of thing, no way do I want to diminish the idea that salvation in and of itself is probably the greatest gift. The, it is the greatest gift, the most tremendous gift we can have. You know, my sister passed away a couple of years ago, quite unexpectedly. And uh, I know that J.R. passed a number of months ago. Yes. The reality is those people aren't even thinking, in my view, about what's going on down here because they are so in love with the Lord's presence and just being there. Um, so that's the greatest reward. But as I say, those other rewards, and I agree with you, there could be this proximity, this inner circle ability that, and, and we almost see some of that too uh, in the book of Revelation with uh, certain individuals who have greater responsibility and ruling than others. But the, the whole thing though is, and I think this is where people get a little bit mistaken, the emphasis is not on us. It's always on the Lord. What do I bring to the table that will glorify the Lord? And, and, and you know, for that reason, I think people get lost in the Lord in heaven. And, and, you know, as far as people saying, well, that's not fair. How can you get more rewards? What about the parable of the workers? Mm -hmm. Until the very end of the day, the landowner was hiring people and he paid them all the same. And the ones who worked all day were like, well, wait a minute. How can you pay them? I worked more. And he goes, I'm the landowner. What is it to you if I give them the same wage that I gave right. you? What is that? I was fair to you, right? So why are you complaining? So it, it's that kind of mentality that I think we need to move away from because their focus was on them. And our focus is going to be on the Lord. Let's talk about the prodigal son. Oh, good. good. Chapter 15. Yeah. Uh, starting out in verse 11, uh, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided unto them his living and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. So, and, and this is a, something you can believe. I mean, this is true to life. Mm -hmm. And you've got a son. One is the faithful son who stays and, and he's faithful to the father. The other takes his money. It takes the money and runs, so yes. to speak. Yeah. And after a while, he finds himself flat broke. And he has to come by. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what happened there? What happened? You have a money manager. So, so now, how do you read this parable and how do you deal with it? I love the parable. I love the parable because what it does, as far as I'm concerned, this is an answer to those people who believe that the Christian life has to be so painful because we're constantly working and beating ourselves up emotionally. And if we're, if we're not constantly humbling ourselves and, and filled with this attitude of repentance, we're not doing it right. And this, I believe, speaks to that because, yes, the prodigal son came to his senses, and the text tells us that. Came to his senses, and what did he do, though? He said, hey, you know, even the servants in my father's house get food. I know. I'll go back and, and offer myself as a hired hand. But what's more important or just as important as his attitude was the way the father received him. I mean, here he was. He saw his son from far off, right? Right. Which means he was looking for him. He wasn't just glancing around. He was looking for his son probably every day. And when he saw him, he picked up his robe and ran, something yeah. an older man would never do. Right. And so he embraced him. I mean, there was no sense that, you know, I'm going to make you feel terrible for what you did. He embraced him. And the other thing I love about this parable is the older son. The older son stayed and he did all those things, right? did everything for all outward appearances. He was the perfect son, the loving son, the respectful son. But wait a minute, wait a minute. All of a sudden, he's harboring a grudge against his younger brother. And now he's angry with his father because he doesn't like the way the father's handling this situation. Well, who is really the prodigal son there that either A, never was the son in emotional, emotionally or left a long time ago emotionally and never came back. Indeed. Yeah. You know, we're talking about relationship here. Perhaps 
the, uh, the, the central portion of Christianity. And we read that God mm. is love. That definitive statement, I don't think anybody on earth, including myself, really understands what that means. Mm. How can you be love? And a lot of people fault God for being a kind of an old man with a white beard who rains terror down on certain people over the years and hurls lightning bolts and, and right. rules against great masses of people. And, and they think of God as kind of a celestial ogre of some right. kind, but the Bible says God is love. And to me, this goes to the fact that humans really aren't that conversant with love. All right. No, I at, at their foundation, whereas the book is a the Bible is a book uh, of love. It is, and so when you're talking about salvation and rewards, it, you have to put love right in the middle of it, mm -hmm. and and grace, and you have to begin to deal with concepts that we don't deal with on a daily basis, or we're we're not really talented at right. at, at loving. Well, I look at the father in that parable. <laughs> and, and it's hilarious in an ironic kind of way because, you know, I have children, you have kids. A lot of us have kids. We know what it's like to raise kids. Yeah. And so every once in a while, I'll just kind of give this dig to my son that's supposed to be designed to move him in a certain direction for his own good. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, Jesus doesn't dig me. He doesn't dig me. He loves me and it's his love. If, as I begin to understand it, that prompts me, and that is no better seen than in the Father, and that's in that parable. So let's go back then, and uh, we were talking with you a moment ago, and, and uh, maybe you out there uh, have asked yourself, uh, what do I have to do to be saved? I, I would like to be a Christian. In fact, I think I may be headed toward Christianity, but I'm not there yet. What, uh, what would you say to that individual? Friend? Well. You know, again, I'd go back to the uh, prodigal son. There's three things that the prodigal son did. He, he had been taught the truth, and it stuck with him. It took a while for it to sink in, but it stuck with him. And he was taught the truth, and then while he was away from his father, he actually saw the reality of that truth. And when he saw the reality of that truth, it woke him up so that he was actually able to embrace it, something that the, the rich young ruler did not. And so what I would tell people is that they need to understand who Jesus is. That's the big question. Who is Jesus? Is he just some great guy, some good, some good teacher that lived, or is he God in the flesh who came, lived a life of perfection, died for us so that we could have eternal life? If that's who they believe Jesus is, they're getting much closer. Now they have to embrace it. And that's what the thief on the cross did. He got to a point where he embraced that and understood and was rewarded with salvation. Fred's book, Finishing the Race, deals with the questions we're talking about today. Uh, deals with salvation, deals with heavenly rewards, and I think it, it will stimulate you to, uh, to follow the Lord. Much as Paul said, I don't consider myself to have caught it yet, right. but, I, right. but I'm still uh, pressing, on. pressing toward the mark. And he had the idea that, that until the Lord called him home, he would be doing that. Amen. And that's our response to God. In other words, if you really understand who God is, you will, I guarantee you, press toward the mark. Absolutely. Fred, we're down to about a minute. I, uh, have we answered that, that gentleman's question, that, that lady's question? They're, they're wanting to, to uh, know in their heart that they're Christians. <clears throat> I think if they know who Jesus is, if they deal with that question, and even if they're not sure, then I think that they need to pray to the Lord and say, Father, I want to know who Jesus is. I want to believe what he accomplished is for me. Help me to believe that. It's like when, you know, Peter said, I believe, but help my unbelief. And I think even they get to a point, they use what faith they have to say, Father, come into my life because of what Jesus did for me. I want to turn my life over to you. I want to have that salvation so that I can live my life for you. And I want to glorify you for the rest of my life. Well, Jesus told Nicodemus, who by the way was a, a, a biblically savvy gentleman. <laughs> That's right. But right. in front of Christ, he was nothing at all. <laughs> and Jesus <laughs> said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him 
should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, it's that simple. You have to believe that God is a God of love. You have to accept that love. <clears throat> and what I've been saying, Fred, is that if you're out there and you're uncertain, find a faithful Christian. And, yeah. And ask Good him. Good idea. Ask him, what must I do to be saved? And you know what? He'll tell you. Yeah. Any Christian worth his salt will. That's right. That's right. Fred, th thanks for being with us again. Thanks I for having me. Deeply appreciate it. Always good talking to Fred DeRuvo. Gary Stearman. Keep looking up. <laughs>